thank you and uh, welcome back after lunch. And again, my sincere thanks to the organizing team, Professor Chaudhary and all his colleagues. So I'll be taking uh, maybe 15 minutes to just debrief you about the Inazal, uh, you know, the guidance paper, I would say, which we have come very recently. This is freely available online uh, in, on the JCH, you know, site. Uh, this is, so, you know, why, why we, you know, wanted this uh, guidance paper was because the last, uh, you know, position paper which came from Inazal was in 2015. So this was the paper, and this was that time in association with, you know, Endocrine Society, Indian College of Cardiology, and Indian Society of Gastroenterology. Since then, say for the last six, seven years, you know, a lot of new things had come. So we thought, let's make it, you know, some guidance within, you know, uh, India. And uh, we also wanted to be, you know, a little more practical, which is possible in clinical practice, rather than, you know, following, you know, what is kind of recommended in most of the other, you know, guidelines. So finally, we, we have a, you know, task force of Inazil, uh, the NAFL task force. So around 11 of its core members, we met and then we decided, and this was, you know, COVID time and we did this all online. And uh, 33 working party members were then selected. And then we finally had seven teams with group captains and each team was then given research questions and we had multiple virtual meetings. Uh, uh, and most of you know members of this you know task force and the core committee and the working party are amongst the audience you can see that and even though this was a you know a guidance paper but still you know we followed our proper you know grade system uh, and we came out with you know the level of evidence as one two three and the recommendations also as strong and weak uh, so the guidance you know was basically on three things we thought it's probably not possible you know to cover everything here so we just focused on nomenclature there was a you know debate still going on between nafold and mafold thing and then there was some issues about the lean nafold or nafold and lean what should be so we thought let's sort out some nomenclature on that diagnosis and predominantly on the risk stratification when to refer how to refer whom to refer and what needs to be done at baseline and all that and finally we thought we'll come out with the you know treatment so, uh, as I said, for the nomenclature, as I said, I think we, we, these all 33 members had actually discussed on multiple, on multiple virtual meetings under, as I said, seven groups. So I'll not be able to show you the whole data, but maybe some of the consensus which we finally reached, and then this is what I'm telling you. As I said, this is all paper is freely available online, and you can have a look at the decision. So as far as you know, the nomenclature was concerned, I think NAFLD versus MAFLD, I think it was discussed. And finally, I think the consensus was that probably I think uh, that MAFLD is obviously, I mean, NAFLD, we know there are deficiencies with NAFLD. Professor Sanyal was also pointing out that. But then, you know, the MAFLD is probably not a good replacement because there is or there are issues with even MAFLD as the, you know, terminology. So we said till that time, I think we probably need to continue with NAFLD. Let's see, you know, easel ASLD is also undergoing this consensus, you know, meetings, the Delphi rounds, the, the fourth round is all, almost over. And, you know, so finally we will have something, maybe steatotic liver disease or something will come out. But till that time, we said that we continue with NAFLD, number one. The second thing we said was that, you know, when we say NAFLD in lean or when we say lean NAFLD, we always take into account only BMI. For India, we were saying that anybody who has a BMI less than 23 would be called as a lean NAFLD. But then nobody, you know, talks about the central obesity or, you know, the visceral adipose tissue, which is so very important. And within the lean group, I think there's a lot of data which has now come in, which shows that these patients are, majority of them are insulin resistant. They, they could be, you know, centrally obese. So we suggested that, yes, in addition to the BMI, I think the central obesity, which is clinically assessed, you know, by waist circumference should also be taken into account, you know, while, you know, calling somebody. I mean, these are, you know, not really, we didn't have very strong evidence for all this. So the recommendations here are weak, you can say, and the level of evidences are also three. But this is what we thought it was. As far as the diagnosis was concerned, I think, again, uh, I'll show you the flow, you know, how these patients come to us in the clinic. You know, most often they will come to you with an ultrasound report, which is actually showing a fatty liver, which is being done, say, for elevated liver enzymes or for dyspepsia or whatever. 
So I think the ultrasound and the caps are, you know, the usual modalities by which they have been kind of diagnosed. But the what thing which we kind of, you know, again emphasize what that the you should not just somebody who comes to you with elevated ALT rather than just calling him as Nash, which may not be right because it's kind of a histological diagnosis. I think it's, it's a, it may not be a good idea to differentiate between NAFL and Nash just based on the ALT, and you can just call it at NAFL with elevated ALT. Then we focused more on you know non-invasive assessment. We saw because you know our own data, the consortium data had shown that you know that the liver biopsy in clinical practice is not really maybe widely accepted. So we said that the liver biopsy can be done only if there is a discordance you know between the non-invasive results and if there is a competing etiology, which are you know standard you know guidelines by other societies also. So we said that the, you can probably do the liver biopsy here. Otherwise, I think maybe you can just stick to the non-invasive assessment, ultrasound, CAP, APRI, FIF4, and all those, and maybe then take the help of elastography, and these cutoffs can be taken. Uh, specifically for NASH cirrhosis, we said, again, I think if you look at the ACLD recommendations, they would say that you should the patient should have had a biopsy diagnosis of maybe NASH in the past to make a diagnosis of, say, NASH cirrhosis. Then, we, again, this was discussed. We know that the fat tends to disappear or tend to decrease with the onset of fibrosis and cirrhosis. So I think this is what, again, with a weak recommendation, we had given that once you have excluded all other etiologies of cirrhosis, and if somebody has obesity or central obesity, and in addition there is another metabolic risk factor, you can probably call him as NASH cirrhosis, uh, rather than just calling it as a cryptogenic cirrhosis, because most of these cryptogenics are, we know, are NASH cirrhosis, and this was another recommendation which we had come. Uh, as I said, the risk certification is very, very important, you know, which home to send the patient to, you know, for the, you know, tertiary care level and, you know, the kind of, you know, the setups we have at a primary health care and then the secondary health care levels, I think, you know. So these are, you know, again, the, you know, the guidelines, the Western guidelines where they would use different, you know, steps to, you know, non-invasively assess them, maybe initially by FIF4 or NFS, and then there's a second line which they are suggesting for like fibro test, fibrometer, HEPA score. You know, most of these are patented scores which are, you know, um, proprietary items and then obviously are not available in this country freely and are costly. That is number one. And secondly, all these, you know, cutoffs are predominantly focusing on what we call the advanced fibrosis, which is F3 or more. Uh, so, but then we said, we again discussed this issue and we said that probably that F2 is equally important and I'll show you data on that. And then we said that these patentist scores may not be easily available, so I think we need to be simpler. And even though we know there are issues with APRI, we know there are issues with FIF4, we also know there are issues with, you know, vibration control, transient elastography or fiber scan, but I think in the you know, the kind of prevalence we have and the kind of, you know, um, uh, the, this the disease, we, we said that I think it's good to just use do these two simple scores of, you know, APRI and FIF4, and then, you know, liver biopsy, as I said, only for discordance. And again, if you look at this, you know, MRE is again not really available in most of the centers. So I think what we said was that once you, you come out with, you know, diagnosis of, you know, uh, fatty liver, either incidental or whatever, or I mean, again, this was a suggestion that if possible, I think the, like the American, you know, College of Endocrinology had suggested some screening for obese or diabetic people. You know, once you have fatty liver, we said you just use two scores and predominantly at a primary and a secondary healthcare level where you may not have access to, you know, the transient elastography also. So you can use these two simple scores of APRI and FIB4 and pre predominantly to rule out significant fibrosis, which I said F2 and more. So if you're pretty sure that this patient is unlikely to have significant fibrosis, I think it's just good to continue with lifestyle interventions at the primary level or at the secondary level. And I think you can then maybe, you know, look, follow him up maybe yearly, too early, depending upon, and look at his metabolic risk factors and control those metabolic risk factors. But if you're not sure whether you have, you know, really excluded significant fibrosis, I think the next step which we were suggesting is that you basically do a transient elastography. We know that the transient elastography may not add much to already, you know, APRI and FIF4, but yes, this is, as I said, the fibro scan is no kind of pretty widely available in this country. So we said that next step could be a fibro scan, and then if your LSM value is less than 8.2, I think you can still presume and maybe you can rule out 
the significant fibrosis, which is F2 and this thing. And then again, these patients can be, you know, on a, your follow-up and then the lifestyle interventions and the control of, you know, metabolic risk factors is what is required. If the patient is suggestive of cackled, or even we, we, more than 13.6 based on the meta-analysis, we said we, they can even be called as cirrhosis. I think they need to be managed on the usual lines of, you know, cirrhosis. I think, again, uh, but if the, you know, this is kind of here between 8.2 and 13.6, I think then in addition to lifestyle interventions, we suggested that, yes, a decision to consider, you know, pharmacotherapy, NASH-specific pharmacotherapy can be considered even without biopsy, if the biopsy has not been done. So I think this, these were the recommendations. As I said, we tried to be simple as possible. as possible. And just to show you, you know, why did we choose, you know, F2 and significant fibrosis and why not advanced fibrosis, you know, there's again good data to say that even F2 patients, if you look at their all-cause mortality, is obviously higher than those who are F0. We know that fibrosis is a major determinant, but that even at F2 you can have, and even the liver-related mortality is, can happen even at F2. And yesterday we did discuss this paper, you know, about Dr. Sanyal's group, where the cardiac events and the non-hepatic cancers, they are similar across all fibrosis stages, which means that even at F2, obviously, they can happen. So we said, I think, uh, at, uh, we probably need to just exclude the significant fibrosis or F2 and then take a decision depending upon what it turns out to be. Why did we, you know, APRI and FIF4, as I said, are widely available, and why did we just choose that, you know, 0.45 and 1? Again, there's an Indian data which we looked at, you know, and then this actually had shown that, you know, APRI of 0.45 kind of, you know, excludes any kind of fibrosis or at least excludes, you know, significant fibrosis. And similarly, you know, there was Indian data on FIF4 cutoff which they said that 1.3 may be a little inappropriate for, you know, uh, significant fibrosis. Obviously, it excludes advanced fibrosis. So there they had come out with this, you know, one as the cutoff. So we followed this one as the cutoff to, you know, exclude the significant fibrosis. So once the diagnosis is made, I think the lifestyle interventions, you know, as I said, I think are pretty clear. I think we didn't, uh, they're almost similar to, you know, what is available in the Western guidelines, the kind of weight reduction, the kind of calorie destruction, kind of exercise, you know, and, you know, again, the data on bariatrics uh, surgery and the EBMT is really not available. So I think we gave these recommendations. Uh, and finally, coming to the pharmacotherapy, again, we said that, again, this paper, again, I think we did discuss yesterday about that. When you talk about lifestyle interventions, again, 5% weight reduction, you know, in this particular study by the Gomez, you know, the 5% weight reduction could be achieved only in 30%, and the 10% weight reduction could be achieved only in 10%. And somebody who already has NASH and significant fibrosis and the other groups, you know, many people are not able to exercise, not able to achieve, you know, target. And so even without biopsy, if you think that patient has significant fibrosis, or NASH, I think uh, based on your non-invasive assessment, in addition to lifestyle interventions, you can take a decision to, you know, add pharmacotherapy. And this, you know, slide I had shown in pre-lunch uh, also. So as I said, biopsy proven, if not significant fibrosis or non-invasive, and then you, you know, you can choose between how to choose between vitamin E, pyo, and saro. Again, I think we had given those, you know, some of the questions somebody has, diabetic dyslipidemia goes in favor of saro. Uh, elderly, male, I mean, just, you know, little, the risk of CA prostate, some data had shown that. So we said maybe you can avoid vitamin E. Somebody already with cardiac risk, you know, or postmenopausal females, you avoid pioglitazone. So those kind of, you know, recommendations we had given that how to choose between the drug. Finally, you know, the control of metabolic risk factors is very, very important. And, you know, the diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, they need to be managed, you know, like the usual lines. And the statins, obviously, are not contraindicated, even with elevated liver enzymes. Yes, the caution needs to be taken once they go into decompensation. And I think, again, we had some discussion yesterday on, you know, the evaluation of the cardiac evaluation in these patients. Again, the data was, you know, not very good. But then we, we came out with this recommendation that if somebody has NASH, with advanced fibrosis, and especially if they are associated with, you know, diabetes, I think they probably can be evaluated for the presence of, you know, cardiovascular disease. Now, how to do it? Again, I think there was some discussion on that. The time will not permit me to go into that. 
So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, I think as I said, these uh, recommendations or guidance paper is now available freely online. So we have spoken about nomenclature, as I said, NAFLD, MAFLD, also about, you know, the lean NAFLD. The diagnosis predominantly is non-invasive, liver biopsy only in select situations, discordant, or when there's a competing etiology. And risk certification is very, very important. You can do it with APRI and FIF4. Rule out significant fibrosis, and if you're not able to rule out, do a transient elastography. Control the metabolic risk factors, very, very important, with or without pharmacotherapy. And pharmacotherapy in NAFLD only if you have either histological NASH or if the biopsy is not available, NAFLD with significant fibrosis, non-serotic. So here we're discussing all non-serotic, not in cirrhosis, and how to choose between the three, vitamin E, pyo, and seroglitazar, I think that was also given. And finally, we said you need to have a holistic approach and the, the evaluation of all the metabolic risk factors and the extrahepatic organs is also very, very important and need to be done on the case-to-case -case basis. So thank you very much.